Hello friends, welcome back to the channel for part two of my interview with John Davis. If you missed part one, I'll have it linked in the description where John shares how he came to the remembrance of a past life that he had with Jesus Christ as the disciple John. Today's video will be a Q&A where I will be asking John everything from what did early Christianity look like and what did the disciples do after Jesus left because there's so much argument about the early factions of Christianity and which of them were closest to the original teachings of Jesus. I also asked him the most controversial question that has ever come up since I started this channel, was Jesus a vegetarian? Along with many other things, John's links are in the description. Once again, he has a YouTube channel with over a hundred videos where he shares the teachings of Jesus as he remembers them. He has a website where he offers people readings. He's offering $50 off of a reading for anybody who watches this podcast. So the link to that will be in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Here's John. There's a lot of debate among historical scholars on who Jeshua actually was. Was he an apocalyptic prophet or was he the Jewish Messiah or was he an Orthodox Jew or did he have some Eastern influences? So who would you say that he was and what was his purpose? What was he about? Okay, well, first and foremost, to, to negate a bunch of stuff. He was a man mm -hmm. and he was a, a human man, just like I'm a human man. And, you know, he was a human and it doesn't matter whether he was a man or a woman, he was a human, right? He wasn't big and mystical. Um, he was, he was brought into this world as a Jewish man and he understood the Jewish faith. But when I met him was on his return from India. Okay. People go, he was in India? What, what, what do you mean he was in India, right? Well, when I was in India, I, um, I was there. Remember I told you, my, that's my mom said, go find your own faith. So I went and studied that, right? So in India, I studied a whole bunch of things. I kept hearing about the, the prophet Isa in India. They were talking about the prophet Isa. And I, I'm like, oh, this, this guy's prophet Isa is pretty cool. Who's that guy, you know? And I said, well, whatever happened to him? And they said, well, he went back to his country and was crucified. So in India, they talk about the prophet Isa as, as this amazing prophet who came through their, their region and studied with the gurus. And so he, he was all inclusive in his spirituality when I met him. But that was he had already traveled and done all this work. Um, it's interesting because Isa is also the name that he's referred to in the Quran. So he's Isa there, and he's, he's Isa in India, and he's Isa there. And I know somebody else who did get a regression and remembered sitting at his feet, listening to him, and called him Isa in, in her regression. So Isa was something they got. I call him Jeshua, and it's, it's an interesting pronunciation because the Hebrew spelling is a Y. Right. right? And I, I pronounce it sort of a J-like because that's the Americanized version that I listen to. But when I hear it pronounced in the regression, it's a mix of a Y and a J. So it's Yeshua. Mm, right? Okay. Right. So it's like Yeshua. So there's a, a slight J underneath the Y as you say it. And it's just much easier for an American like me to go Yeshua than <laughs> Yeshua. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So I say Yeshua. But um, yeah, to me, to me, he was a man. He did, by the time I got to him, he was everything I just said to you at the beginning of this interview was what he was teaching. And it mm -hmm. went very much against a lot of the traditions of the time, which, he, which is one of the reasons why he got in trouble, because the organized religions of the time were all about, you have to do this to be a part of us and be, you know, we have control because we have these rules you have to follow. And what, what got him in real serious trouble was all of his teachings was about, you are the creator of your experience. You are the creator. You and God are one. And, you know, that's blasphemous for a lot of people. But even more so, it's dangerous for a, a ruling dictator to hear. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you have the power, they don't. And so, Jeshua was a man who started out as a young Jewish boy who, over his time, he, he ended up getting more and more information. But he also came into this world 
carrying memories of what I would call his Holy Spirit self. Mm -hmm. And so as a child, they there's a story of him talking, you know, teaching in the temple, right? right. And I don't know this for a fact because I didn't know him then. I didn't, I don't have this memory, but I'll bet you anything he was, he was clarifying in the temple. You know, taking their their text and changing it, which is why they're all like talking to him and hanging out with this little kid. He's got these deep thoughts, you know, uh -huh. you know deep deep thoughts with Jack Handy, like they used to say on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so if you know you you meet a kid who has deep thoughts, you get really into talking to him. My son shocked me when he was six years old. He one day said to me, he said, uh, "The God is in everything and everyone, and we control the God part inside of us." Wow. At six years old, he said that. So I think when we come into this world, we were just, we just left unconditional love. We just left the mm -hmm. source and the consciousness of God, right? And we bring some of that with us. And then our hormones kick in and we lose all that crap. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> it's like, my God, I'm here and I'm in my fear. I don't remember any of that. Um, but, I, you know, I find that as I, as I walk through life and I get to that space of just feeling again, I, I feel like I'm going home, you know, <laughs> I really do. I feel like uh, that I'm bringing home here. Well, or I guess it would say bringing heaven to earth, right? Um, I, uh, that's an interesting, I never thought about it that way, but myself, I just had that realization. But yeah, you bring heaven to earth by, by being love here. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why I'm seeing the consciousness shift right now is because people like Jeshua, Buddha, you know, Muhammad, they came here knowing and understanding their higher spirit self and what we're doing now is, is we are rising to the higher spirit self we're getting closer to it in sufism they would say the veil is getting thinner because mm. they they believe that god is on one side of a veil and we're on the other side of the veil and the veil is our fear and life is the struggle against the veil so would you say that there was any significance like any spiritual significance to why he died on the cross or was that just simply a result of him threatening the powers well it, it was both actually um there, there's several things in this number one he was threatening the powers he was threatening the, the jewish powers and the roman powers you know everybody wanted him gone because it was taking the power away from them right the other thing is that he knew was that his followers were going to be eviscerated, mm -hmm. right? And the fastest way to stop his, the people following him from getting hurt was to give himself up. Mm. So he's like, okay, I, I don't want my people to be persecuted. And, and but they ended up being anyway, right? But, but, but he, he went ahead and, and took one thing off the table, basically, him. And so spiritually, it was the most loving thing he could do. Right. Right. So he was still doing loving things. And, and, I'm, and I, I don't know if I shared this uh, on any of the other podcasts I've done, but um, there's a really profound moment for me personally that I remember from the crucifixion. And um, it always kind of tears, you know, gets to me, it hits me because, so let me just, let me just describe it this way. The hill of Golgotha was a stone hill. It was, it was like being on giant, on top of a giant boulder. And what they mm -hmm. had done is they had chipped holes into the top of that hillside because they were reusing crosses. Okay. So, so the cross could be taken down and put back up. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that cross was down. They laid, they just were on it. They nailed him here, not here. Everybody thinks it's here. Right. Mm -hmm. They nailed him here because there's a loop there, which holds the, holds the nail right here. It rips out. Right. right. Um, so they nailed him here. And then you always see the depictions of the cross with the little foot rest, you know, they're crucifying somebody. Why do they want them to be comfortable? Actually put his feet on the side of the cross and nailed it in sideways. So now he's on the cross. So here I am. John was the only, only disciple who saw it, like I said. And I'm sitting there. And the reason I was there was because I was there 
to take care of his mother and his wife because they were there yeah. and, I, and my job was to take care of them. I was going to make sure they were fine. So I'm there and I'm taking care of his mother and his wife. And this is where in the Bible, it says, he says, you know, mother, there's your son, son, there's your mother. Right. And John took him, her into the, his house, which is that part is true that he took her. I don't remember. The, I don't remember the line, but John took the wife and the mother into his house in Galilee and got them away from Jerusalem that night. And they, okay. they left like right away, but I'm sitting there and I'm watching them push his cross up with him on it. And the cross raises up <laughs> and it, um, it drops into that hole. And you can probably imagine how excruciating that would be. To have oh nails. yeah. And a kaboom, this big hit. And what happened was when it hit the bottom and he bounced, he looked at me and he said, and he didn't say anything, but he gave me the look a friend would give a friend. And he went like, well, that hurt, you know, <laughs> it was kind of a, like a making me feel better about what was happening. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it was like, he was going through all this and suffering, but at that moment he was worried about me. Mm. And that to me still to this day gets me because it's, it's like, wow, you know, that's, that's so, that's so completely loving, you know? Um, and I, 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 I often get the question, you know, why, why was, you know, he's a disciple that he loved and why is he called the beloved and all this stuff? The reason that is, is because after meeting Jeshua, John never took a wife, never took, he, he was solely on that mission mm -hmm. and in john's life when jeshua touched him that was the moment of john being loved by god right and so he was i'm the one that he loved because he touched me and loved me and so it, it wasn't a hierarchy or uh setting me up you know setting john apart yeah his name was johannes ben zebedee and mm -hmm. um and uh Jeshua called him Hannah. So, so my past life it was Hannah, which is a, so such a, so interesting to me. Um, but he went to that cross to save his people from being harmed. And and here's the next thing: you know, we wouldn't be talking about him right now if he didn't go to the cross, if he didn't martyr himself, mm. because you know he would have been just one one more guy who you know who was there and. You know, eventually they would have would have killed him somewhere else, or they they'd have tried to do something else to him. Mm -hmm. But by putting him on a cross and putting him, making it very public to show everybody, everybody saw it happen, and now he's a martyr. And so, you know, that's 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 the um, the strength of what he did. And right now, it's two thousand years later. We're still talking about him. I've read Dolores Cannon's books where she regressed people who had known Jesus and. In one of those books, I think it was the one where she regressed someone who had been his niece. She said that they attempted to kill him several times and he, like they put him in a crate and threw him over a cliff and he, he could have easily rescued himself if he had wanted to, but um, he knew it was his time and that mm. he had given himself up. So what was his personality like? What was it like to be around him? He was hysterically funny. <laughs> he laughed all the time. And he it was funny because one of the ways that he, he spread love was he would just make you laugh. Mm -hmm. He would walk up to you and just make you laugh. And um, he, he would, you know, prank you. And, but, you know, people say, what kind of great pranks would Jesus do, right? <laughs> he, he didn't do little big mystical things that a lot of people say he did. But he did do a lot of amazing things. Mm -hmm. Um, and there, I'm, I'm sure there's some that he did that I just don't know about. Cause I don't have those memories, but, right. um, but I know I saw him after, after the crucifixion. Right. So, yeah, cause I, I took Mary, the two Marys out and I came back and I, I helped take him down, take him, carry him into the tomb. And that's, I have memories of going in. I don't have any memories of going back and finding it empty. Do I know whether that happened? The memory that I have of him afterwards was um, I was on a boat um, 
with Peter. And there's a story in the Bible that says that um, Joshua appeared on shore and they told him to cast the net to one side of the boat and they pulled the fish out. And then they realized it was Jesus on shore and, they, and you know, Peter jumped in and swam to the shore. Um, the memory that I have is that, that story, but I don't remember the fish part of that story. I just remember seeing him and, on shore and then falling at his feet and then looking up and seeing him. And somebody always asked me about, well, was he glowing or what, you know, and he looked, I said, no, he looked just like you and me. Like he was just there, just like a normal guy. Right. But I saw him crucified and I saw him die and I put him in a tube, but then I saw him standing there. So, I mean, but I think, as I said before, like the gurus, you, you go to the other side, you can re-manifest the body. And I think that's exactly what he did. Do you have any memories of what happened after he left? Because I know now there's a lot of discussion about the various groups of early Christianity and which ones were the closest to the original teachings. Do you remember what you did, like what you and James and Peter did after he left? Well, well J- James, Jesus' brother, there's because there are a couple mm-hmm. of different James. James Jesus his brother, he was he was actually very forefront in, in spreading the word and he was martyred for it. They, you know, John was the only one of the of the original 12. So when I say 12, people people should think of the 12 more like bishops. Mm-hmm. You know, they were in charge of areas. Now you're the you're the overseer of this area. So that's your you're you know, you're that bishop, right? So the 12, but there are a lot of people who followed him. And there was a lot of people who were there with him all the time. But these 12 guys uh, were s- s- parted out to be leaders in certain areas. So it was much, it was much less esoteric and much more organizational. Mm-hmm. Um, John took the two Marys to Galilee to his family home. And they lived there. Uh, for a while and then what eventually happened was um his mary of magdala's family came from magdala to get her and took her back to their family they were a very wealthy family and they, they yeah. went back to, to magdala mm-hmm. by the time of the crucifixion joseph was already dead so he was an older man already and that's why that's why mary came to my house instead of someone else's house because i was one taking care of her Eventually what happened was I took her to Turkey to, because the, uh, it was getting even dangerous in Galilee to be there. Mm-hmm. So we, we went to uh, Ephesus and we were in Ephesus. And once there, I left her with somebody and I don't know who it was, but I know that I, I left her and I went out to the various places to teach and was arrested and, and was, was imprisoned. Um, and then after the imprisonment, I came back to Ephesus and she was already, she was already dead when I came back. Um, and they know, they say that her tomb is in Ephesus still. And John's, oh, mm-hmm. tomb, John's tomb is in Ephesus as well. Mm-hmm. And going, going through the Gnostic text in the Nag Hammadi library and the Dead Sea Scrolls, I found a really interesting story of John in his old age in Ephesus. And when I hear when I hear this story, I'm like, I totally can see me doing this. Um, I can totally see me the. He's in the room, and, and and they're all saying, you know, you know, please, you know, John, tell t- tell you were the last one who saw him. You know, can you tell us the story? And it's it's right there in the in the in the dead. It's either the Gnostic text or or it's one of one of the ancient texts. But he gets up and he slowly walks to the front of the room, and he gets up there and he goes love one another and then he turns and starts to walk back <laughs> right and they say tell us more and he says i can tell you no more until you learn this oh wow <laughs> right and so i could totally see myself doing that you yeah. know i love one of that because that's all it really is that's all it really is and john in the book of john is where it says god is love mm-hmm. that is the actual text there so um as far as the other teachings you know, Paul, if you look at the New Testament, it's very interesting. Paul, um, who also ended up being martyred. Yeah. Um, I don't think he was martyred for the reasons why 
people think he was, but I wasn't there and I don't have memories of this. Okay. So I, so I can't really, but um, when you look at the, the new Testament, there's a couple of things that are really interesting. First of all, Paul is the only one who never met him in life. Mm -hmm. It was a vision on the road to Damascus. Um, Paul is also the one that is the majority of the new Testament. Yeah. Okay. And if you read the, the teachings of Paul, Paul is the one who gives all the rules you have to follow. Mm -hmm. Right. There's even a rule in there that says no man shall grow his hair longer than his shoulder because yeah. Jesus's hair was only that long. Right. Um, which is really fascinating because Jewish men at the time wore their hair long mm -hmm. and Roman men didn't. There's an interesting thing where Paul lived with the governor Felix. Yeah. And people say he was imprisoned at governor, governor Felix's house, but then you also hear he taught Felix Christianity. Right. So he was living at his house. He was teaching him Christianity. Paul was also one of the two that was a Roman citizen. So he was actually part of the Roman culture, basically. And so I, I often wonder whether Paul was trying to like really put the Roman rule into Christianity at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's true or not. It's just an extrapolation from what, what I'm experiencing. But I do know in, in the 300s when Constantine came, uh, and this is just from studies that I've that I've researched. He showed up at the Nicene Council dressed as the pagan sun god, and did not get baptized until his deathbed. And so, the Nicene Council is where they got rid of got rid of almost sixty books. Yeah. From the and that's where he became the son of God. And anybody else after the Nicene Council that didn't believe that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's where the majority of, of the struggles of our world have really come from is, you know, we are right and you are wrong. And that's the, that's the way it is. You know? Exactly. It's, it's sad because it goes completely against the entire teachings of the man when he was here. There's a movement that says that Jesus was actually a vegetarian. Do you have any memories about that? I remember him eating lamb and fish and and I remember him, his favorite food was figs, though. He loved figs. But um, I remember him eating, and there is a text, and I, like, once again, I don't, I don't remember whether it's the Bible or the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Nakamani Library. They, they said, Jeshua, what diet should we follow? And his response was the perfect response. He, of course, it was the perfect response, right? So he says, I would be more worried about what comes out of your mouth than what goes in. I'd be more worried about what comes out of your mouth. Think about what I said earlier. What you put out, the words that you're using mm -hmm. are creating, right? So the very beginning of Genesis, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So you're putting your words out with belief. It goes out into this energy, and God creates it in his image around you because we live in God's image, mm. right? So our words and thoughts go out into this, this experience of God, and God says, okay, have your belief, have your belief. And so I'd be more worried about what comes out of your mouth. Now, I will say, you know, you know, the whole concept of praying over your food, that happened. And I think that was really, it's really about the, the vibrational space of gratitude and love and, and compassion. Um, when, I look, when I look at Jeshua's main teaching, I go back to the, the thing that he said, I leave you this one commandment, love one another. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I when I when I look at that, I see infinite truth. Um, you know, I traveled, I traveled to India, I'm sorry, I, uh, Egypt in the year 2000. And I, I I've been all over that whole part of the world. Um, <laughs> but I walked into, into Egypt and everywhere I went, I was treated like a prince. Treated like an absolute prince. Everybody loved it. You know, it was like, I love them first. That's why. Mm -hmm. you know, I went there just enjoying the country, enjoying the people. I, you know, I made friends with the people who, who rented camels and horses on the Giza Plateau. So I went and hung out at the stables with them. I ended up meeting one of the most famous archaeologists in the world 
Egyptian archaeologists in the world because I made friends with the stable guys, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so interesting. So I ended up going, I, you know, the whole time, I ended up going out to the Mount Sinai that we talked about. And I get out there and I meet the manager of the hotel I'm staying at. And that was a, that's a very kind way to say building with huts around it. <laughs> uh -huh. hotel right and the center building have you ever been over no i've never been yeah. the center building is like a big room and on one side of the room it has um the desk where you come into the hotel but the other part of the room is the basically the dining room mm -hmm. and then there's a door to the kitchen and what you do is you come to this room at, at five o'clock and everybody gets dinner at the same time and he serves everyone the same meal you don't get to order anything. But when I arrived at that, at that hotel, I walked up to that desk. I walked in. The first thing I said was, I love your country. I'm having such a great time. And he, you see the smile come across his face. Mm -hmm. He says, what's your favorite part? I said, the food. He says, what's your favorite food? I said, right now, I love koshery and fool. And he got this look on his face. He says, what? He says, that's what we eat. That's not what tourists eat. <laughs> right? Right? I said, no, I love it. It's great. When that meal came out that everybody was getting the same meal, I got koshery in full. Mm -hmm. He made it specially for me, right? Wow. Yeah. So when you're at that mountain, you start climbing the mountain at one o'clock in the morning. And the reason you start at one is because you get to the top at sunrise. And so that's the coolest thing in the world. You're you know, up on Mount Sinai at sunrise, right? Mm -hmm. So I started climbing at one. At 2.30, I hear a voice in the darkness. John, John. And I have to tell you, if you don't think it's trippy to hear your voice called in the darkness on the side of Mount Sinai, you're wrong. <laughs> I'm like, what the, whoa, 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 right? But it wasn't God. <laughs> you know, it was that manager who made me koshery running up the mountain to give me a coat because I, he thought I was going to be cold. Wow. Right. So I, I, this was an hour and a half into my climb. He came up an hour and a half that mountain to give me that coat. Amazing. Right, that's how it, how it's treated everywhere. So the next day I go down from the mountain and I go to St. Catherine's Monastery, which is a Greek Orthodox Byzantine monastery. It's the old arts there and the incense. It was like the most perfect experience to, to go in and smell it. And it was just wonderful. And, um, I suddenly hear this. Hey, are you American? I said, yeah, I'm American. He says, yeah, me too. He says, have you been having problems since you've been here? I said, not, not at all. He says, I said, everywhere I go, they're treating me like a prince. He says, everywhere I go, they want to fight me. Five minutes later, I, I swear, I wanted to fight that guy. <laughs> right? He was putting that out. He was, he was sowing and reaping. He was sowing fear and anxiety, and he was getting it back. Mm -hmm. I was sowing love, and I was getting it back. That, that's the message of Jeshua. Walk through life, life loving one another, and you'll get it reaped upon you. And if you can just stay, keep it that simple in the regression, I said, it's so simple, we can't understand it. And I really think it is that simple. God is in every moment, in every breath, and in every experience of your life. And if you can walk through life, loving one another, just loving one another, you know, that breath is right there. You're going to, you're going to experience it. And I'll tell you the, uh, the really, the quickest way to change somebody, just smile, just, just mm -hmm. truly smile. And you'll see them, people do the double take and be shocked. And like I said before, but just smile because that's giving love. That's simple. It's mm -hmm. a simple way to give love. I had a, I was at a, <coughs> I was at a restaurant one time with a guy who was very unhappy about being at that restaurant. As we walked into the place, he says, I hate this place. I said, I love this place. What are you talking about? This is the greatest place. This is like a kitschy diner on the side of a highway. It's the best, right? <laughs> and, uh, I hate to hate coming here. And we sat down at the table and the waitress came over to the table. The first thing she said to us was, I'm having a bad night. I'm sorry. It's going to reflect on the service. The guy at the table with me was instantly mad. So what could I do? I said, I'm so sorry you're having that. Why don't you sit down? I'll get you some dinner and I'll take care of your tables. Mm. Right? <laughs> and she says, what? I said, no, 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 really sit down. Have a she starts laughing because she realized what she had said, what I was responding with was not, at all what she expected, right? Uh -huh. And then I spent the rest of the dinner making her laugh. Wow. Now let me, now let me tell you how, how, that, how we sowed and reaped. Our salads came to the table. 
Mine looked like she had gone out in the garden, freshly picked each one by each leaf by hand and every vegetable by hand. It was like a piece of art. The guy sitting across from me, his salad came and it was obviously the core of the iceberg lettuce. <laughs> okay. He complains. Hi, hey, what, what is this? Ah. And she gets all, <laughs> takes it back to the kitchen. 10 minutes later, comes back out. She obviously went to the kitchen and broke it into six or eight pieces and brought it back out. <laughs> right. So then our meals come. Mine was, looked like choirs should have been singing how beautiful this meal was. Mm -hmm. Perfectly cooked. It was tasted wonderful, beautiful. His was partially frozen. Oh, wow. Right. He hated this place. So what did, he, what did God give him? A, a reason to hate it. I love this place. So I, and I gave love and then I got reasons to love it. Mm. That's how simple this really is, is, is love the things you do. You know, love the experience of, of being, you know, uh, did I tell the story about the, the agoraphobic woman that I was helping? No. Mm -mm. Woman completely agoraphobic, couldn't, didn't want to leave her house. So I started coaching her to get, you know, to help her out. And one day I, we were, I took her to lunch because I want, I, my, one of my things was I'm just going to get you out of the house. Right. So I took her to lunch and she, whenever she had to leave her house, she was terrified of driving. Mm -hmm. We're driving. And suddenly I hear this little voice from the passenger seat. She says, why do cars merge with you easily? And I said, because I love driving. If you love driving, driving gives you a reason to love it. Mm. Right. It's that simple, right? What happened to that lady? She ended up going off and did a solo trip to Africa and hung out with gorillas, the Jane Goodall gorillas. And she did it on her own by herself. I'm so proud wow. of her. Wow. So proud of her, right? Um, and that's the kind of stuff that happens in the private sessions is I do these private sessions that are like spiritual coaching. I help people break out of their out of their limitations that they put on themselves from the religions, from their belief systems. And I break them past that and um, we get into, you know, helping them to achieve something different and more loving, more caring and more productive. Would you like to share what you do and how people can get in touch with you? Okay. The easiest way to find me is actually on my website, johnofnew.com. And it's called John of New because uh, when one of those psychics actually channeled Jeshua, and the first thing that came through her was, John of old, John of new, I love you. I've always loved you. I will always love you. I'm with you. I've always been with you and I always will be with you. So it starts out with John of old, and John of New. So I call myself John of New because I'm John Davis. I'm not Johannes Ben Zebedee, mm -hmm. right? And I'm in this moment. So that's why it's John of New. So johnofnew.com. Um, you can go there. You go to my YouTube channel. There's a, over 100 videos there that talk about all the stuff that I'm talking about now. Some of them are controversial, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, I, I hold nothing back. I speak my truth. But here's the other thing. I don't ask anyone ever to believe what I say. Spirituality is a personal journey. You have to feel it for yourself. Feel the truth for yourself. If it feels right for you, follow it. If it doesn't feel right for you, don't follow it. You, know, you have to come to your own conclusions and your own, your own path because it's your path, not my path. So I, you know, if you find truth in my words, wonderful. You know, if you don't, I, I respect your beliefs and go mm -hmm. on. Uh, I also mentioned those sessions. Um, Whenever I come on an interview like this, I like to make sure I give something back to the audience who, who have spent the time with me and let's, let me use their ears for a little bit. <laughs> um, so um, I always offer $50 off my sessions. I do 30 and 60 minute sessions. Um, the way they usually work is uh, about an hour before I do one, I sit down um, and sometimes it, it's tough because of the situations of all the ones that are happening. But um, I always make sure that every one of my sessions is an hour before and an hour after. And I sit down and I just write notes. About an hour before, I, I get these, these notes and I just sit down. And then when the person comes on, we just start talking. And then we start breaking them out of these beliefs that they have been created from fears and anxieties that have been cast upon them through religion, from their past experience with parents. That's mm -hmm. a big one, getting over parents and 
the restrictions that have been put on their beliefs. Um, and I help them, you know, use that time. We, we use that time to um, just basically clear the junk out and get moving towards something better. Wonderful. So I will have all of your links in my description, your YouTube channel and your website. Thank you so, so much for spending this last hour and a half with me and with my viewers and sharing from your experience and your memories. Um, yeah, is there any final words that you'd like to say before we go? Yeah, uh, I wanna just say this. Today's moment, this moment is tomorrow's outcomes. Stay very present and just love it. And you'll have a loving outcome. Amen. <laughs> so simple and so practical. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.